Okay, take your Bible this morning and turn back to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. I know it probably gets pretty confusing to those that see these messages out on Sermon Audio or on uh, YouTube because it's basically been the same three verses for the last three weeks. <laughs> and hopefully we'll get through verse 3 this morning. We'll finish it up. We'll move into the next part of this. I've entitled this lesson, Going on to Perfection, Part 4. Going on to Perfection, Part 4. Now, I know, you know, we, we have throughout the years made it quite clear to you and to me as justified saints that we are in Christ perfect and complete. You understand that, right? When the scriptures say you are complete in him, we have everything necessary for our eternal salvation. We stand in Christ Jesus, clothed in his righteousness, robed in his righteousness, and before God Almighty, you and me, sinners by birth, by nature, by practice, and by choice, and we have to be right here. We are holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in God's sight. Now, that's amazing grace, is it not? To think, to, to just think, and you don't have to think back far. You know, we, we, like to, we like to project ourselves back and look at the bad things from years gone by, the sins that we thought were grievous errors. You don't have to look back much further than this morning, <laughs> if we're honest. I mean, I, I, and we're going to talk about that in the worship hour this morning. Men and women that are unregenerate, though, though they can be moral and sincere and religious and dedicated and they can avoid a lot of things that the world and even the scriptures call sin, they are absolutely clueless as to the reality of the uh, malevolence of this issue, which is sin in the heart of man. You and I, on the other hand, we understand that what God requires is something that we in ourselves cannot possibly do, even assisted by God the Holy Spirit. Now, I do, and I think you do too. I do want to love God, don't you? I mean, I, every, every morning when I wake up, other than my feet hurting and my body getting older, when I get out of bed and every morning, I think I, would, I, would, I truly want to love God. I do. I want to love him perfectly and completely. I know one day I will. But sadly, I have to confess that I know in this life, it ain't going to happen, pardon the bad English. But I want to. And I want to love my neighbors myself. When somebody does something wrong to me, I, I, I would love to be one that could just stand there like our blessed Lord. When he was spat upon, he didn't spit back. When he was, was ridiculed and tormented and tortured, he, he, he kept his mouth shut. He suffered silently. Huh? Is that us? <laughs> it should be, and I want it to be that way. But I know the reality is I can't do that. Now, I don't use that as an excuse to not try. I try to love God, and I try to love my neighbors myself, but like the Apostle Paul said in Romans 7, the good we want to do, we don't do, and the evil we don't want to do, that's exactly what we find ourselves doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. I, if you ever get to the point to where you don't see yourself in that state, listen, examine yourself. Examine yourself. Because that, that, that's all we got for the remainder of our lives. We, we, we are in a warfare. We weren't in it before. I mean, I, I spent many years in religion, thought I was in a warfare, was not in a warfare. I was struggling with myself trying to accomplish and establish a righteousness by my preaching or by my teaching or by my loving my wife or my loving my neighbor and continually coming up short. But thinking, even though I was coming up short, I thought I was doing pretty good. And as I was trying hard, God's saying, ah, it's okay. He's trying. Look, it ain't that way. Nowhere in this book does it say try. It says do. And any, any, any failure along the line where you don't do, you are immediately disqualified if your salvation is conditioned on your doing. 
here. So we need to know up front, even though this, this lesson's entitled Going On to Perfection, it's not like you and I as God's children, and Paul's not implying this, nor is the Holy Spirit implying this. It's not like whatever these things are that he's discussing here that we should move on from. That now there's something else we need to do to be more holy or more just or more qualified or more entitled to, to be nearer to God. Look, everything I need I have in Christ. If I, if I took my last breath this moment, or you, if, you, if you've rested in Christ, you have everything you need. Isn't that amazing? Not only is it amazing, it's humbling. Because it's freely given. There were no conditions on you. None whatsoever. But Paul's... Paul was dealing with men and women that were, were, were having a desire to go back. Were being called on by friends and families. Come back. Go back to these things. And he has been instructing them, look, the child of God wants to go forward. We want to grow in grace and knowledge is the truth. We want to mature in this most holy faith. Therefore, if we go on to maturity, we don't have to keep hammering these things like we're trying to convince you. I'm not trying to convince. If you believe the gospel this morning, I don't have to convince you that God is just to justify you based on the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have to keep rehearsing that. No, we do. We talk about it. But we talk about it for comfort and encouragement. I'm not trying to convince you. But if you're here this morning and you have not believed this gospel, you have not rested in Christ is the Lord your righteousness, I'm reasoning with you based on the same thing that comforts God's children. I'm reasoning with you, be reconciled to God. Same message. <clears throat> and that's all we got. If you come back here, Lord willing, if I preach into my, into my 80s, the message will not change. Now, we can talk about a lot of different things. And there's a lot of different things that we should talk about. But we cannot talk any, about anything in this book apart from the believer's acceptance already in Christ, fully entitled to all grace here and all glory hereafter. Now, he's talked about several things, these principles of the doctrines of uh, 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 of Christ and he's told them in verse, verse 1 let us go on to perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead work you don't have to do that anymore we've repented and a faith toward Christ you've rested in Christ these people had claimed they'd rested in Christ and that's the thing you've got to get in your mind is, or you'll be so confused in the book of Hebrews he's dealing with those who have truly believed but he's dealing with many people who think they've believed. I tell you what, if you were on Facebook, the way I'm on Facebook, and the way Ray's on Facebook, the people that we encountered, there are so many people out there who think they believe the gospel. Now, they're reformed. They believe in the five points of Calvinism, and I swear I get so sick and tired of hearing about that. And that's the way they always approach it, is they want to talk about the five points. Well, that, that, that's doctrinal truth. You cannot deny that. You cannot take this book. I don't care who you are. You cannot deny any of those five precepts that are set forth in the Scriptures. I, yeah, I mean, I, I know it, it gets, a, gets a bad connotation to it because it's got that man's name attached to it, Calvin. And that's, that's part of the problem. We're not talking about a man or a doctrinal position. We're talking about truth is what we're talking about. But here's the thing, and, 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 and Bill said it Wednesday night, and it, this, this is where the rubber meets the road. You can, you can always find out exactly what somebody believes when, you, when, you, when the question comes up, what about those who have not rested and heard this gospel believed in this Christ and have this, their hope in this righteousness. What about them? And I tell you what, I don't care how reformed they claim they might be, every one of them at some point they got some problem 
with repentance from dead works. They got, they, they're hanging on to something back out there. Or else they're hanging on to some relative, you know. Ray and I have been dealing with this young man on, well, I hadn't really been dealing, I, I got out of the, I got out of the fight, Ray's still been dealing with, but he's on this thing of doctrinal perfectionism. That he claims that, that in, in, and listen, y'all would know, because y'all have been around me for over 35 years. Have I ever said you got to be a Calvinist to be saved? One time? Have I ever preached that? That you got to submit to the five points of Calvinism before I, you'll... Con Cause this ain't about convincing me that you're saved. You understand that? Because if I believe you're saved, I ain't to judge. But they seem to think, well, these folks like us and Bill and others that preach this gospel and stand dogmatically and uncompromisingly on it, that they say that you have to believe the five points of Calvinism to be saved. And said that. Don't believe that. I don't think the thief on the cross could have. Well, I know he couldn't because there was no five points of Calvinism when the thief was on the cross. That was 1,600 years later. But I know this, I know he knew how God was just to justify the ungodly. You say, how do you know that? How can you come up with that idea? Here's how I know it. Remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Because here's the thing. If God don't remember him, he's not coming in. Ain't got nothing. He didn't say, remember what I've done. Because what, what, what did he done? He's dying on a tree. He's guilty. What's he asking? Remember me in yourself. That's what he's saying. He said, you can't get that from... I, I tell you, if, if you don't believe that, you've never read this. I, you've read the book, but you hadn't been enlightened by God the Holy Spirit. And that's not a prideful statement. That's just reality. Folks, it's, it's not me doing the teaching. It's God the Holy Spirit that teaches his people. But these people... Now, they, they're, 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 you, he, he, this guy, he keeps going on and on and on about this. But you know what this issue is? We found out. Ray found out. You know what the issue is? He claims he was saved when he was, what, about four or five years old. A child, which I'm not saying that children can't be saved, but I tell you what, I'm not, I don't, I'm not pushing them. I've never pushed a child to make a profession of religion. I haven't even pushed an adult to make a profession of religion. Not going to do it. Because I'm not going to give you, I don't want you to have some false hope, some false sense of security, some false profession that you can look back on, some emotional experience where you can say, I know I'm saved because this happened. That's not, that's not salvation. But he claims that his godly parents who were Arminians, who were free willers, who believed that God died, you know, God loves everybody and Christ died for everybody, he wants to save everybody, that they read the scriptures over him. When he was a child, all his life, and the Lord saved him at five, he made a profession of religion, five or six years old. I don't know exact time, time frame, but the implications are too great. Because his thought process, and I know how in men's problem, you people you say, well, you just don't know. I do know. I know what his thought process is. If this is true, what about my mom and my dad? Because here's the thing, they're measuring God. He kept, kept talking about godly parent. Look, how, Matt, how am I godly? Matt's seen me at my best and at my worst. Huh? There they ain't no, nothing godly about this man and himself. But I tell you what, in Christ I'm godly. You see that? That's the difference between grace and works. But man's mind has got it to the point as long as somebody is trying, they're godly. Uh-uh. The truth stands forever, dogmatically. If you and me are not perfect before God's law and God's justice, and we do not have a righteousness that equals and answers every single solitary demand of God's law and justice, we are going to hell. 
I don't care how many years you've gone to church. I don't care how many times you've been put in a baptistry pool. I don't care how many times you've talked about I love Jesus and saying, yes, I love Jesus. If you don't have that righteousness, the righteousness of God, you're gone. You'll perish. And so he's telling them, look, we've got to move on. Let's go on. And we came to this one. Here's, here's where we're at this week. Look at verse 2. He says, we need to leave this one behind, of the doctrines of baptisms. You say, well, that's infant baptism and pedo, you know, uh, water baptism and sprinkling. That ain't got nothing to do with any of that. Nothing to do with any of it. Matter of fact, you know, you think about it, there's, there's so many different opinions, so many different views on what the implications are and what Paul's talking about here when he wrote this thing that when we need to move on to perfection, we need to not have to talk about the doctrines of baptism. But I think this is kind of interesting. And the problem seems to be from the fact that he talks about the doctrine not of baptism, but baptisms, plural. And it is plural in the original language. And really, look over at chapter 9. Let me show you this. It could be, and to me this answers the question. And I think this is where we get into a bind because we, we, we don't understand the original language and we see and the translators will put the same word, baptisms, moving on from the doctrines of baptisms here in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 3, and then he uses the same word in Hebrews 9, verse 10. And it's in reference to the, those various washings. Because remember, he's dealing with people who had come out from underneath the old covenant. Those various washings of those particular animals before they were sacrificed. Look at verse 10, Hebrews 9. Which stood only in meat and drinks and diverse Underline that word washings and right beside of it, baptismo, because that's the, that's the Greek word. And it's the same exact word that's used in the text that we're looking at in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 3. It has to do with immersion. And he says here, with that, that old covenant stood in diverse meats and drink offerings and different washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. What was the time of reformation? It wasn't when John when, when Martin Luther tacked them treatises up on the door of the Catholic Church. That's not the day of reformation. What was the day of reformation? Here's the day of reformation. It is finished. It's set aside. And see, the, the laying on of hands, it, it, that he look, look, at, look back over at our text, look at verse 3, because he says, of the doctrine of baptism, of the doctrine of laying on hands. This doctrine of laying on of hands could be a reference to all those worshipers. You know what they did before they, they gave up their sacrifices? They laid their hands on them. They laid their hands on them, on those animal sacrifices. What did they do when they laid their hands on them? They confessed their sins. And identified themselves. When you laid your hands on that animal about to be crucified, be killed, what were you saying? It should be me. It's right there. Substitution. And all of that was part of the old covenant, and it was abolished. Listen, all that old covenant was abolished by Christ, whose blood, what does it do? Why do we no longer need to offer our animals and sacrifices? Christ's blood washes us and cleanses us from all our sins. Now, this phrase could actually be arranged to read this way. The baptisms of doctrine and the imposition of hands. There, there, there are two things that are peculiar to the gospel. You know what the first thing that's peculiar about the gospel? The doctrine of it. It's peculiar to the natural mind. But the second thing is this, the extraordinary gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're a long way from where Paul was at here because at this particular time, folks, the Spirit was, was unique in the way that he displayed himself to these particular believers. 
And one of the things that I find interesting about this, when you think about the baptism of doctrine, you know, doctrine's compared to baptism in the scriptures. Did you know that? The people were said to be, listen, baptized into Moses. When? When they were initiated into his doctrine, the truth that he set forth. We know that to be the case because, listen to this, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10 of Moses and all those believing justified saints back in the Old Testament. Moreover, brethren, I would not have you that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same, now listen to this, they ate the same spiritual meat. Now, all of Israel ate the quail, didn't they? Huh? They all ate the, the manna because we know after they ate the manna, what did those rascally Jews say? I guarantee you it wasn't, wasn't Joshua and Caleb and Moses and Aaron making this statement. Who made this statement? We loathe this light bread. That's unbelievers. Believers were content with the manna. They were content. You know, they, they said, give us, give us meat. We're tired of bread. God gave them meat. And then when he got meat, what did they do? They complained about the meat. But he says here, they did all eat the same spiritual meat. What is that? Spiritual meat. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ here in John chapter 4 when he met that woman at the well? And the disciples had gone away to get something to eat. And our Lord had dealt with this woman and she went away. And when they came back, they bid him to eat. And he said, I've had meat to eat that you know not of. What kind of meat had our Lord been eating? Spiritual meat. Because what had he been teaching that woman? The doctrines of Christ. Who he was. I'm, I'm the son of man. All right? Uh, they, you know, that, that's, that, he goes on, he said, did he all drink, eat the same spiritual meat? Did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drunk of that spiritual rock. Not all national Israel, who drunk of it? God's elect in that particular generation. What they drink of? They drank of the same spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Same gospel, same truth. It was in type and in picture. We have a clear presentation of it today with God's holy word written down. They didn't have that advantage, but if folk, Christ, if he, that spiritual rock was Christ, one thing I know about our Lord Jesus Christ, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So whatever he is to me today, what was he to them? He's my hope, what was he to them? He's my righteousness, what was he to them? You see that? They drank the, And how did we hear about that? You have to be taught. So th this is the first baptism of the gospel. It, even its, its doctrine applied by the Holy Spirit in conversion. But the second peculiar thing of the gospel is a communication of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Listen to you. Being assembled together with them, this is our Lord. He was assembled with his disciples. Commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. 50 days later, 50 days after the crucifixion, what were they? They were baptized with the Holy Spirit. So more specifically, the apostle here is talking about doctrines concerning baptisms. The doctrine concerning the believer's objective and subjective sanctification and purification resulting from the fact that they have been regenerated and converted by God the Holy Spirit under the preaching of the gospel. 
And see, here's the thing. Both are involved in a believer's, this, this doctrine of the gospel, in the extraordinary gift of the Holy Spirit. Both of them are involved in a believer's union with Christ, outwardly expressed in the sign of baptism. Now, we, we, do, we do emphasize everybody that's rested in this righteousness, whose hope is Christ alone, what should they do? They follow Christ in believer's baptism. It doesn't save you. It doesn't make you more holy. It doesn't get you any closer to God. What is it? It's an outward sign of an inward identification with Christ and his people. It's all baptism is. It's not... It, I, listen, I can remember, and this is how, how weird our minds were. I can remember, I don't remember from my childhood when I was baptized. To me, probably when I was six or seven, when I made my first false profession, it was, I just remember being excited about getting in a baptismal pool. I do remember that. I don't remember much about it. But I tell you what, when Pam and I got involved at Broad Acres back over in the, in the, in the early 80s, and we had had a tremendous religious experience. I remember when Don Fletcher put me in the water, when I came up, it, I almost had one of the experiences where I saw, thought I saw heaven open up. And I felt just, I came out of that water just energized, you know. Couldn't wait, I was on a Sunday night, couldn't wait for Thursday to go out and just Share everything with everybody on Thursday night visitation. After a while, it wore off. You know, and then it, all that rededicating started up. You know, I, Pam and I always set up like the second row. And I know I've told you this before. Every single solitary service just about I walked the aisle. I, I think Don Fletcher got to the point he was like, oh, my God, he's coming again. You know, I mean, I, it, it was a trail wore out from that second pew where I came up every time. But I needed something to keep confirming me in all that feeling and emotion. And, and the realization that I, I, I couldn't live up to anything. I couldn't, couldn't, I wanted to. And it seemed like every time I'd rededicate, I, it, it'd last for about 24, 48 hours. And then it would, it would go back off. But, the, but baptism, I didn't, when, when, when David Stepp baptized me, I don't know when we did that. However many years ago it was. It's been a while. <laughs> you know, didn't feel anything. Now I was. I was. I, I know I was emotional when I baptized many of our brethren and our sister brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, it was an emotional thing because you can't help but be emotional. But be, beside the emotion of the situation, there was didn't change anything. Not a thing. But it outwardly identified everybody in Grace Baptist Church this way. All of us have the same hope. Without a doubt. But it's also expressed inwardly, wrought by God the Holy Spirit and the grace of God. Now how does he do it? See, that's the question. How does God do that? He does it through the means of the gospel. It's doctrines. It's particulars. In opposition to all those legal temporary washings and sprinklings that had been occurring all those years under that mosaic economy. But here's the thing. Subjectively, our hearts are purified and sprinkled from an evil conscience. And our bodies are washed with pure water when by God-given faith we see our, and I think that these words subjective and objective have always thrown me, thrown me for a loop. Subjective is something that I actually feel or experience. Objective is something that I observe. And so our bodies are washed with pure water by God-given faith when we see our objective oneness I don't feel that. I'm one with Christ in the eyes of God's law and justice according to his express purpose. And I tell you, it's a, it's a miracle of grace. It's not something mystical, and it's not something emotional. It's just a fact, a hard, cold fact. Every time I say that, I always think about dragnet. <laughs> I don't know why. Just the facts. 
That's all this is. It's a fact. And you've got to get beyond the feelings thing. If I, if, 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 I, if I were to actually go by the way I felt, I feel lost most of the time. Don't you? If, you're, if we're honest. But faith is opposed to feelings. <laughs> Isn't it? And what he says over in Hebrews 11. How did he state it? I can't believe I can't remember that. Just haven't preached on it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. I, don't, I, can't, I can't see eternal life in me. I just believe and know it. Because God promised it. See, so it's not mystical, it's not emotional, it's something, not something ethereal, it's not something that we can put our arms around. <clears throat> it's God's truth heard, understood, acted upon by the faith that God creates in the heart of his children. Here's the next thing, of the laying on of hands. Of the laying on of hands. Listen to these two verses. Then laid there they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. That's Acts chapter 8, verse 17. It says, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Listen to, the, listen to this part of that verse again. They, he, he laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Not just one isolated person out of the group. How many of them did? All of them. All of them. This, this laying on of hands was a sign by which those that were baptized at this particular time it was a sign that they had received the gift of the Holy Ghost that was peculiar to that particular time, a long time ago, that passed away. The gift of tongues no longer exists. The gift of healings, no, though God does heal, those things no longer exist. You say, when did they, when did they, when did they cease? Go read 1 Corinthians 13. When, when the scripture of God was completed, we didn't need that anymore. Why? Because we, we have that which is perfect. We have the word of God. They didn't. They, did, they couldn't go down to a store and buy a King James Version or whatever version of the Scripture. They couldn't even, folks, they couldn't even, as a commoner, they couldn't get a hold of the Greek and Hebrew manuscript. So the only way the gospel could be conveyed is how? God the Holy Spirit had to move in a miraculous way to confirm that his apostles were who they were and that what they said was the truth of the matter. And here's the thing that's so ironic about this. Back in that particular time, these gifts weren't confined to just a few people, but to all. Matter of fact, there were even some who were not truly saved who were able to evidence these things. Have you ever thought about the fact that Judas Iscariot was able to do the same exact thing that the other apostles were able to do? Because if he hadn't have been able to do it, when, you know, when our Lord sent them out to preach and they were casting out demons and doing all these things, if, if he hadn't have been able to accomplish those things, you would have never saw them, heard them that night around that table saying, is it I? Is it I? They would have knew who it was. So whatever, whatever they were able to do, these, a lot of these people were able to do it. And, and we know that, that there were those who fell away. If you go down and, and you read on further through this book, or verse 4 here in our chapter that we're looking at, it said they were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. In a sense. 
And see, these gifts were proof, the, the fact that they had these gifts was proof positive that that whole economy had been abolished. <clears throat> and that God himself had instituted the gospel economy that we're now in. But look at the next thing. And of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. I, one thing that pops in my mind that I think about a lot, if the dead be not raised, there's no resurrection, then we, you and me are of all men and women, what are we? We're most miserable. And I'm found a false prophet, just like the Apostle Paul was. Because what have I testified to you? That God raised Christ from the dead. And I tell you, these two truths that he brings out, this resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, they, these two truths confirm the absolute necessity of true faith and true repentance because, listen, there is an eternity to spend either in eternal blessedness or there is an eternity to spend in eternal misery. One of the two. And this speaks primarily, this, he's talking about this resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. It's speaking primarily of the body. That this, you, you do realize that this body of clay that we live in that, that's growing older, wearing out, filled with disease, racked with old age, one day this flesh is going to be raised out of the, out of the ground. And this mortal is going to put on immortality. And this corruption is going to put on incorruption. Be made like unto our Lord. And listen, it's going to happen. The, the resurrection and the reuniting of the body and the soul is going to happen for the saved. And who else is it going to happen for according to the scriptures? The unbeliever. The unbeliever. Those who are justified in this life, who rest in Christ's righteousness, they'll have their bodies purified totally and completely. All the weaknesses, all the infirmities will be gone. They'll be made incorruptible and immortal to enjoy rest and glory for how long? Forever. They'll be glorified with the Lord Jesus Christ. But those who die in unbelief, Die in their sin. Die in an unjustified state. Either ignorant of or having never submitted to Christ's righteousness their only hope and cause of salvation. They'll also be raised. And they'll be reunited with their souls that are already in everlasting torment, eternal torment. And they'll spend forever in everlasting torment. Because he says it's of eternal judgment. Eternal judgment. Now, I'm not going to go a long ways into this, but I tell you, you know, we're, we're going to all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Bill talked about this last week in one of the one of the messages. And, and, but at that judgment seat of Christ, believers aren't being judged. We were already judged to where at Calvary. But we appear before that judgment seat of God to vindicate the character, uh, uh, God's character, in the salvation of sinners by Christ before this whole world. That he's just to justify the ungodly based on a righteousness they had no part produce and maintain. In the same way, God's truth and faithfulness and justice at that great white throne judgment, it's going to be vindicated. Before the whole universe when he does what? He damns all those who have rejected Christ and his righteousness who die in their sins. But here's the thing you got to realize. This final judgment, it's not going to determine or alter anybody's state before God. The state was already set. When was it set? Go read Romans 9. They were vessels of wrath fitted for destruction or they were vessels of mercy prepared before unto glory forever. And see, here's the thing. The knowledge of the resurrection of the dead 
in eternal judgment. You know, it's a great encouragement to believers to do what? To continue in the faith. We, we should have a, a great respect for the recompense of the reward, and we should see the afflictions of this present time. What? They're not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. These truths also ought to be an encouragement for us to be truly concerned for the eternal state of our loved ones, our friends, our family, and even our foe. I think about Stephen. When they were stoning him, what was his prayer? Lord, lay this not to their account. They know not what they do. And we won't compromise. We ought, we, we ought to do everything we can to tell lost sinners the truth. Because I, I, I don't want anybody, to, I don't want to see anybody, and, and we, this is true, I don't want to see anybody perish in eternal torment. Do you? Now, I know it's going to happen, but I don't want it to happen. And as long as I've got breath and the ability, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to preach the truth as it is in Christ Jesus to everybody the Lord providentially brings me across in hope that if they're one of his elect, what will he do? He'll bring them to true faith and true belief. Paul wrote this, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade man. Because we know this, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a true and living God. Look at this last phrase. Look at verse 3, and we'll quit. And this will we do if God permit. The apostle says, I'm going to go on to teach the particulars of the principles of the doctrine of Christ, if God permits. What does he mean by if God permits? Well, you think about this. This situation that Paul finds himself in. <clears throat> You know, God removes the gospel from those who show little interest in it. And that ought to cause us to take heed and give the more earnest heed to God's gospel from the spirit of adoption. You know, we don't have, I've said this for years. Because I, 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 me and Bill were talking about this. We were sitting on the back porch last week when he was here. Because, you know, when Bill and I started, we were both young men. I was 29 when I bet Bill, 20, 29, 30 somewhere in there. Bill was about, well, Bill's about six years older than me. Well, now Bill's closing in on 70, and I'm 63. And, you know, I, I know we still have young people coming along in our church congregation. And I, I worry about this a lot. I do. I mean, worry is sinful unbelief, but I can't help it because I'm you. I think about your children. And when your daughters and sons get married and they have children, what, what about this gospel? And I asked Bill, I said, Bill, I said, you ever thought about what's going to happen to Eager Avenue when you get to the point that, that you can no longer preach? And he said, I think about that all the time. And I, tell, I think about that all the time. I mean, I often wonder what will happen to Grace Baptist. I mean, I know Kenny and all fill in in my absence, but, you know, at some point in time, old rich man's going to get to the point he ain't going to be able to do it anymore. And that's why I'm telling you why the gospel is at your arm's length. What should you do with your children and your friends and your family? There's no promise. Religious facilities go on. Now, you know, they, there ain't no doubt some of these religious groups out there, they've been around for hundreds of years. But I tell you what, the gospel comes, the gospel goes. When the Lord is pleased, you know what he'll do? If it's his will for there not to be a gospel church here, you could find yourself in the same situation. You folks that's been with us on Zoom on Wednesday night, the, there's folks out there would give anything to be where you're at. Anything. Because they're out in the middle of nowhere with no gospel. The only gospel contact they have with other believers is on an electronic Zoom meeting. Now, they can go to church or what men call church, ain't the same thing. They're searching. We have it. And we should take advantage of it. We've got to tell you, there's very few parents, and I even find myself guilty of this, I didn't spend the time that I should have when my kids were growing up teaching my children the gospel. The majority of the gospel I taught my boys, you know where they heard it at? Right here. 
either from me or Bill or Henry or anybody else that was preaching this guy. That's where they heard it from. I didn't sit down with my boys every night and pick up the Bible. I should have. I didn't. I'm guilty. But my boys were under the gospel every time the gospel was preached. They had no, they had no, as long as they were living with me, they had no rights to tell me no. And they didn't. They came to church, heard the gospel. The Lord was pleased to bring them both to true faith and true repentance. And I'm thankful for it. But I tell you, if I, as your preacher, wasn't spending time teaching my kids, how about you? So if the only place your children are getting the gospel is where the gospel's preached and you don't ever bring them here and you don't spend the time to teach them the gospel at home, how are they ever going to hear it? You say, God's absolutely sovereign. And I tell you what, you're absolutely responsible. You hear me? Every parent needs to realize, I, you, can, you can't fall back on the sovereignty of God to defend a lazy position. You should teach your children. You should, listen, the gospel should be the number one priority for every parent who has children. And God help you if it's not. Because I've seen too many times through the years that I've preached the gospel that parents were not insistent enough of keeping their kids under the gospel where they're at today. We've been together 35 years, folks. Where are all the kids that started with? I know God's absolutely sovereign. and We did our part to provide the means to get the gospel to them. But I tell you what, you got to put them under it. You should. And he's saying, what he's, what he's telling here, he said, if God permit, permit it, is it. God will, will never fail to permit a believer to advance. You hear this? Will never fail to permit a believer to advance in the maturity of the faith. He will not. But he will under certain circumstances. Prevent a false professor. People who have it up here. But don't truly believe it. They, they receive not the love of the truth. He will prevent a false professor from going on. Because their works... In the heart of a person who continually rejects and refuses the gospel, a hardening until they get to the point they cannot go on to salvation and maturity because they just won't. They won't. And we've seen it happen through the years. We've seen people come and stay for a while and then go away. And I've told you this all the way back to when we started together. 20 more years, if the gospel's being preached and you're not here, the problem ain't with the gospel. The problem was what? You received not the love of the truth. Because listen, a child of God can't lose their salvation. That's not what he's implying here. One of God's sheep can never go away, and God will never cast away one of his own. We'll stop right there and come back together next week. You're dismissed the worst time.